so hi everyone uh, good evening uh, we'll be starting with our discussion on congenital brain anomalies i'll just share my screen one second this is a topic uh, which gets asked a lot as spotters and nothing else <laughs> so you won't really get any long answer question from this most of the times or uh, you know you don't really expect uh, a long case also on this but overall a lot of spotters do come from this and and uh, uh, a good topic to overall study so let's start um Basically, I uh, the, the source is all Osborne today. You guys had requested one Osborne uh, series, right? So this is more or less that only. I, I'll be covering uh, uh, four chapters from uh, uh, Osborne, the last four chapters. If you see the unit on congenital anomalies, just trying to share my screen. Uh, there are four uh, chapters on that, out of which there's a whole unit of six chapters, out of which two we have already covered in our, our neurocutaneous syndrome class. They're also had taught from Osman only. Thank you. I'm feeling much better today. My throat was completely down. I've been on antibiotics for a few days now, so now better. But the screen is not getting shared. Second. Let's try. Now it should be done. So, uh, yeah. So three parts I'll be talking about. First, we'll be talking about posterior fossa anomalies. Then I'll talk about neuronal migration defects. And then I'll be talking about uh, uh, segmentation defects like holoprosencephaly and its variants. So that's how we are going to be addressing all of these anomalies. You would have seen a lot of these as spotters. We have also discussed many of these as spotters, you know, when we did NeuroRAD and our spotter quizzes, we have uh, been discussing these. Okay. All right. So, so let's start. Okay, so when we talk about the embryology, you don't really need to know much. Uh, the embryology of spinal dysraphisms that we've covered is actually more important than this. But here, just to give you a basic introduction into how things are being done. So this is how our neural tube is. So this is the anterior aspect of the neural tube. One second. Yeah, so this is the anterior aspect of the neural tube, which is going to eventually form the brain. So here you can see essentially three components you would have studied in medical school about the three parts. So this is the prosencephalon, this is the mesencephalon and this is the rhombencephalon, right? So these are the three parts here that you can see. Next, this, uh, this is further going to divide. So you can see that the prosencephalon has now divided into the two parts. So the two parts here that you can see are the telencephalon, which is going to form the brain eventually. And then what is this? This is the diencephalon. So diencephalon is what forms the hypothalamus here. Okay, so this is what prosencephalon is going to form. Mesencephalon just elongates to form the midbrain. So this is what is going to elongate to form the midbrain. And rhombencephalon further divides into two. So we have metalencephalon and you have myelencephalon. Myelencephalon, as the name suggests, is going to form the medulla oblongata, which continues as the spinal cord. And metalencephalon is going to form the cerebellum. So this is how we have our brain dividing into different segments. So prosencephalon dividing into tele and dien, mesencephalon elongating to form midbrain pons, and rhombencephalon forms the brain stem essentially, so cerebellum and part of pons and medulla oblongata comes from here. So this is how we have and then eventually the telencephalon which is going to form the cerebral cortex undergoes this gyration and sulcation. So this is how a brain at around 20 weeks period of gestation will look. Okay, So this is the time where only the sylvian fissure comes into picture. So this is the earliest that we have and eventually from 20 weeks still a full mature brain at around 32 weeks, this is how the fully mature brain is going to look with all of the gyration and sulcations. In addition, we have migration of the neurons, which is also a very complicated process. So you have these glial cells, which are going to guide the neurons. For example, if this is the cross section of the brain, they tend to migrate from the center to the periphery. Okay, So the glial cells are going to guide and that is how the neurons go towards the cortex and they become well differentiated and eventually we end up with a six layer cortex. 
any of this goes wrong, we are going to have the anomalies that we are going to study. Okay, so this is uh, just an introduction, not very, very important. Imaging modalities, it is MRI, one and only investigation that you will be needing here. Few sequences uh, which you want to keep in mind. Uh, sagittal T1 IR slash T1 flare is something that you routinely don't do, but you must do it here because it shows you the best gray matter, white matter differentiation. So that is your primary sequence. You want to start off with a sagittal and then plan accordingly. So your first sequence must be sagittal T1. Normally when you're acquiring MRI, your first sequence is sagittal T2. But whenever you're suspecting a congenital brain anomaly, it's a good idea to start with a sag T1 one because it shows you the gray matter white matter differentiation the best and you can get a preliminary idea of what you're dealing with a volumetric sequence is also a good idea like an mp rage for t1 people also do cis or space uh, which can be a 3d sequence which is a 3d sequence or you can do a sagittal or a coronal heavily titivated uh, sequence the reason is in schizin kefili you know you want to see whether it is open lip or closed lip and no other sequence in in you know certain cases can help you accept this so that's the indication of doing this cis sequence uh, so you can also do a 3D space, which is essentially a 3D T2 weighted sequence. There is no indication of doing uh, diffusion weighted imaging. There is no indication of giving contrast in most cases. The only place where you may want to give contrast is when you're suspecting a focal cortical dysplasia. Uh, and, and you know, you are not sure if it's an FCD, there are no associated anomalies and you want to differentiate it from a tumor. That's the only indication of giving contrast because FCD is not going to focal cortical dysplasia is not going to enhance, whereas other tumors will show some enhancement. So that's the only indication of giving contrast. Apart from that, nowadays people are doing diffusion tensor imaging, which will uh, help us uh, get an idea about white matter tracts, particularly when we are dealing with uh, corpus callosum, agenesis or dysgenesis. Okay, so these are the sequences for MRI. Now going on to the topic per se. So the first chapter that we are dealing with here are posterior fossa anomalies, wherein the main consideration is going to be the carry malformations and then dandy worker malformations and the variants. Okay, very, very important. So before that, just for the juniors here, I just started. I, I barely did embryology a little bit and imaging modality and sequences of MRI. Now, starting with the core topic of posterior fossa anomalies. So, starting with the anatomy, particularly for the juniors, just to get an idea of what normal looks like for. So, see the schematic. So, here you can see this is the clivus bone. This is your basion to opisthion line, right? So, what is the cutoff below which the tonsil should not go and we call it tonsillar ectopia if it is how many millimeters or more yes if it is more than five millimeters or more it is abnormal we call it tonsillar displacement and there are many different uh, differentials there and we'll talk about that so that is the first thing so this is the clivus basion and opisthion what is this part here do you see this bump here i have also talked about this somewhere i don't remember where yes this is the obex good so what we can see here is the nucleus gracilis this elevation is that of nucleus gracilis so the part of the fourth ventricle that corresponds to this bump this part here is the lowermost part of the fourth ventricle and that part is called as the obex below this point below this elevation of nucleus gracilis we have the central canal which communicates okay so this is the diamond shaped or the rhomboid shaped fourth ventricle and this pointed end this is very important to see you know that this pointed end should be like this and this part here is called as the festigium so this is called as the festigium of the fourth ventricle in posterior fossa anomalies you will see that the festigium becomes rounded it is not pointed and you will also see in carry malformation that tonsillar ectopia is there but along with that even the obex herniates down so we want to see both because we are seeing brain stem herniations so you want to look for both is it just the tonsil going down or is it the obex also going down okay so that is one more consideration that you want to keep what is this here what is this fissure called of the cerebellum so you can see that these are the cerebellum folia and this particular fissure here very 